psychology book because in it God illuminates the heart. Now I think most of us know this and understand this, but do you know even the Bible itself says the very same thing? Hebrews chapter 4 verse 12, for the word of God is alive and powerful. It is sharper than the sharpest two-edged sword, cutting between soul and spirit, between joint and marrow. Listen to this next phrase. It, talking about the Bible, exposes our innermost thoughts and desires. One thing that a psychologist does in therapy is to work with their patients to help them identify their own defense mechanisms. We all have defense mechanisms, and we use them to shield ourselves from the truth. Defense mechanisms are a part of self-justification. And self-justification is an obstacle to acknowledging the truth. In Luke chapter 14, Jesus talks about people who made excuses to get out of something that they didn't want to do. And Jesus points out that their excuses were nothing more than lies combined with self-justification. Luke chapter 14, verses 15 through 24. Hearing this, Jesus had been talking about the kingdom of God. Hearing this, a man sitting at the table with Jesus exclaimed, What a blessing it will be to attend a banquet in the kingdom of God. And that man's statement allowed Jesus an opportunity to teach them a truth about the kingdom of God. Jesus replied with this story. A man prepared a great feast and sent out many invitations. When the banquet was ready, he sent his servant to tell the guests, come, the banquet is ready. I want to pause there for just a moment, and I want to point out two things. One, the man had sent out invitations beforehand. And two, when the banquet was ready, he told his servants to go tell the guests that the banquet was ready. How did the guests become guests? They became guests because they accepted the invitation. But when the time came, of course, things changed. They all began making excuses. One said, I have just bought a field and must inspect it. 
please excuse me. Another said, I have just bought five pairs of oxen, and I want to go try them out. Please excuse me. Another said, I just got married, so I can't come. The servant turned and told his master what they had said. His master was furious and said, go quickly into the streets and alleys of the town and invite the poor, the crippled, the blind, and the lame. After the servant had done this, he reported, there is still room for more. So his master said, go out in the country lanes behind the hedges and urge anyone you can find to come so that the house will be full. For none of those I first invited will even get the smallest taste of my banquet. This is a story about people who made excuses for something they didn't want to do instead of just telling the truth. And they made excuses so they wouldn't have to be truthful about declining the greatest invitation ever given. Let's take a closer look at Jesus' parable. What do you think of the excuses that they made? Let me read them again. One said, I have just bought a field and must inspect it. Please excuse me, another said, I have just bought five pairs of oxen and I want to try them out. Please excuse me, another said, I just got married, so I can't come. Does anything sound off to you in these? I bought a field and I must inspect it. Who would do that? Who would buy a field without first inspecting it? And you know, if someone were to do that, the field would still be there tomorrow. It wasn't going anywhere. The man had already accepted the invitation to the banquet. This was no reason. I bought five pairs of oxen and I want to try them out. Who would do that? Who would buy that? Who would buy oxen without even knowing whether or not they could get the job done that you needed them to do? And again, if they did, the oxen weren't going anywhere. They could be checked out the next day. I just got married, so I can't come. Well, you know, on the surface, this one seems a little more believable, but it's not really. This is a reference to uh, a verse in Deuteronomy chapter 24, verse 5. A newly married man must not be drafted into the army or be given any other official responsibilities. He must be free to spend one year at home bringing happiness to the wife he has married. This is a regulation about freeing him from military service or an official duty but it's not something that was intended to isolate him from social contacts. The reality is, is that this excuse was just as transparent as the others. A marriage certainly involves new obligations, but it doesn't cancel out other obligations. Remember, this was just a banquet. This man had accepted the invitation to the banquet already. What do you think their motive was for their excuses? Well, you know, to really understand this, I think we have to look at the context. So if you have your Bibles handy, just take a look at Luke chapter 14. In the first six verses, Jesus is eating dinner in the home of a leader of the Pharisees. It was the Sabbath, and Jesus healed a man, and that angered the Pharisees. Jesus always spent time with people that the Pharisees thought of as sinners, or undesirables. The sick man would have been an undesirable. This angered the Pharisees. They isolated themselves from associating with such people. They thought Jesus should be part of their secret club. They thought Jesus should have avoided these sinners and these undesirables as well. They thought he should spend all of their, his time rather with them. What was their problem? Their problem was self-interest. It was their club. It was their organization. You had to be like them if you were going to be with them. And Jesus wasn't like them. Jesus was vastly different than they were. Their problem was self-interest, and they went to great lengths to protect their self-interest. In verses 7 through 11, Jesus talked about the people who had come to the dinner that he was at. When Jesus noticed that all who had come to the dinner were trying to sit in the seats of honor near the head of the table, he gave them this advice. When you are invited to a wedding feast, don't sit in the seat of honor. 
What if someone who is more distinguished than you has also been invited? The host will come and say, give this person your seat. Then you will be embarrassed and you will have to take whatever seat is left at the foot of the table. Instead, take the lowest place at the foot of the table. Then when your host sees you, he will come and say, friend, we have a better place for you. Then you will be honored in front of all of the other guests. For those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. Jesus was watching, and the guests were scrambling and maneuvering for the seats of honor at the tables. What was their motivation? Well, again, it was self-interest. Jesus confronted them about it and talked to them about the importance of humility. In verses 12 through 14, Jesus talked about those who were invited to the dinner. Then he turned to his host. When you put on a luncheon or a banquet, he said, don't invite your friends, brothers, relatives, and rich neighbors, for they will invite you back, and that will be your only reward. Instead, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, and the blind. Then at the resurrection of the righteous, God will reward you for inviting those who could not repay you. What was the problem? Well, you guessed it. It was once again self-interest. Self-interest prompted them to invite people who could reciprocate, rather than invest time in people who are too poor or who are unable to return the favor. Finally, in the passage we're looking at tonight, verses 15 through 24, it's self-interest again that is the problem. The three men who were offering the excuses simply didn't want to go to the feast. In the immediate context, the application is to the Israelites of Jesus' day, who rejected him as Messiah. The secondary application for us is that we, too, have been called to the kingdom of God, and we, too, have accepted that invitation. And Jesus wants us to know that we, too, can allow our self-interest to keep us out of the kingdom of God. So how do we work through our own self-interest problems. The simple truth is that all of us, to some degree, struggle with self-interest. That's really the first thing that we need to do to work through our self-interest problems is, that acknowledge, is acknowledging that we do have a self-interest problem. If we deny that we have moments when we struggle with self-interest, we're deceiving ourselves. Why else would Jesus tell us to deny ourselves if there's nothing to deny, he wouldn't have. And if there is no self problem, then why does the Bible spend so much time talking about the problem of self? Why does Paul speak of the struggle between the flesh and the spirit if there is no struggle? So, because we're human and we are not unique, we have to deal with self-interest in our lives. And another truth. Self-interest will prevent us from giving our lives over to God. Self-interest can negatively impact our moral life. We don't want to obey God's moral law. We don't see it in our interest. Instead, we want to do what it is that we want to do. So we refuse to submit. But we don't want to call it disobedience. So we justify our behavior. Self-interest can also negatively impact our service to God. It's not likely that we have to go inspect a field or test drive oxen, but we can make other excuses. I'm too young, so I really don't have much to offer. I think I'll just sit and learn from those who are older. And I have kids now, and I have my job, so I really don't have time to contribute the way I should, at least not right now. I'm too old to serve now. I really need to let those who are younger take the lead. We don't want to work in the church, but we don't want to call it disobedience. So we justify our behavior and the self-justification goes on, cycle after cycle. You know, we're all busy and we're all challenged by self-interest, but we all have a responsibility in the kingdom of God. And there is work to be done and the work of the church isn't for a select few. Each one of us, each one of us, is called to do our part in the work of the church. 
Ephesians chapter 4, verses 15 and 16. Instead, we will speak the truth in love, growing in every way more and more like Christ, who is the head of his body, the church. He makes his whole body, still talking about the church, fit together perfectly. Listen to how he does this. As each part, each one of us, does its own special work, it helps all of the other parts grow, all of the other members of the church grow, so that the whole body, the whole church body, is healthy and growing and full of love. This is the only way a healthy body can function. This is Christ's plan for the church. Again, none of us are superhuman. Every one of us has some self-interest in our lives that we have to manage. If we don't, it will manage us. If we have accepted Christ's invitation into his kingdom, it's clear we must follow through. And Jesus is serious about this. Notice his sense of urgency in verses 21 through 24 of Luke chapter 14. The servant returned and told his master what they had said. His master was furious and said, go quickly into the streets and alleys of the town and invite the poor. Hurry up, go quickly. Go quickly and issue the invitations, he says. Invite the poor, the crippled, the blind, and the lame. After the servant had done this, he reported, there is still room for more. So his master said, go out into the country lanes and behind the hedges and urge anyone you find to come so that the house will be full. For none of those I first invited will get even the smallest taste of my banquet. Again, those who refused the invitation to the banquet in this story refers to the Jews who rejected Jesus and his invitation. Verses 21 through 24 that we just read probably represents the invitation to the Gentiles that God would later send via the apostles. But all of that has already happened. And these verses that are in the Bible are for us. They still have meaning for us today. We cannot accept Christ's invitation into his kingdom and then act as if we're not a part of his kingdom. We cannot reap the benefits of Christ's promises if we neglect Christ's commands. We cannot have the kingdom while simultaneously rejecting the work of the kingdom. Saying that obedient participation in God's kingdom will somehow be more important later just doesn't make sense. And trying to make it make sense is just a defense mechanism. It is just another form of self-justification so that we'll feel better about not getting involved like we know we should. Now, I do want to say something at this point. We don't need to walk around with the weight of guilt on our shoulders. Again, as each part does its own special work. It helps the other parts grow so that the whole body is healthy and growing and full of love. We don't have to carry the burden of the work of the church, the whole burden on our shoulders. Jesus has designed it in a way that it's not a burden. He's designed it in a way that it's a joy. But each of us have to do our own special work together to make that a joy, to make that joyful. So, what I'm saying tonight isn't intended to make people feel guilty. It's to remind us of the importance of what we're called to do in the kingdom of God and to get us excited about it. Soon, we're going to be returning to spend more time together in worship, in classes, in service, and in fellowship. And I know that this has been a challenging year. And I know that we've all been busy in many ways. But let's resolve to be active in the church this next year with each other and with all of us working together.
Thank you.